everyone. Happy Friday. We made it. We're here. <laughs> um, so yes, another webinar. And this one is Infant Care Excellence, Creating a Nurturing Environment in a Daycare Setting. And so for, like Justin mentioned, it is jam-packed full of information. Um, and that's even with me trying to like sift through it and say, oh, we could take that out. We could take that out. Um, so it is a lot of information. So bear with me, but it's very informative. And so for this webinar, we're just going to go into the art of providing exceptional care to our youngest learners. Infants require a special kind of attention and care to thrive. And this webinar is designed to equip, equip you with the knowledge and strategies strategies needed to create a nurturing environment that promotes their overall development. And so if this is your first time, um, my name is Darlene Ayala. And if you've been here before, you already know me, <laughs> but this is just another recap. And so I am the director of Buma Work in Century City. I'm also a provider success coordinator for the company. I am deeply passionate with early childhood education and have been within the field for about 12 years now. I've done all the roles that that contains, assistant to the director. Um, I have a deep passion for the Montessori method. I have both credentials, um, two credentials in the Montessori field, focusing on infant and toddler care and preschool age children. I hold both a bast uh, bastard, uh, bachelor's and master's degree in child development. And uh, my commitment lies in creating a loving, joyful, safe, and nurturing environment for all students, families, and staff members. And so like we do every webinar, we want to get to know you. And so in the chat, if you can go ahead and put your name, the name of your school, if you're part of our Bumo network, and if your center offers an infant program. And, you know, I just say that because maybe some of your facilities or your schools, you know, are thinking about implementing that into their um, current program. And so I just kind of want to see who already has um, a center already within their schools and who doesn't. So if you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourself, um, put that in the chat. Perfect. Thank you, Justin. And for my school, we also do, uh, we have infants. So we start at six months um, and go up to 23 months. And then they transition over to our preschool program once they reach 24 months. And so we have both infant and preschool programs within our school and Bumo work. Anybody else? All right, well, uh, go ahead and just, when you have the time, you know, go ahead and, Sabrina, hi, Sabrina. You have infants age six months to 24 months. Awesome, perfect. Are you part of our, uh, or what's the name of your school, Sabrina? Homegrown, love it, awesome. Thank you for sharing, nice to meet you. All right, so we're going to jump on in. Like I said, you can go ahead and um, input that information later if you like, and I'll check back in. And so for the agenda, hi, Judy. Academy for Early Learning, two months to five years. Awesome. Perfect. It's awesome. Great. And so um, agenda, so understanding the needs of infants, promoting cognitive and sensory development, creating partnerships with families, and then a Q&A. Hi, Ashton. I work at a bright day ELC, and my center is children from ages two months to five. Awesome. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Um, and so, like I said, this webinar is loaded with a bunch of information, and so we may or may not have time for a Q&A at the end. Uh, we'll kind of play it by ear. If we do have a couple more minutes, you know, we can maybe, I can maybe answer a question or two. If we are over the time, we don't have the time, I will provide my email address and you can email me those questions and I'll be more than happy to email you back with those answers. Um, so I just wanna let you know in advance that we may not have the time, but we will try. <laughs> Um, so we're just going to go into it, right? Understanding the needs of infants is obviously important. And so what that looks like is knowing their milestones within that first year. 
um, providing emotional and physical needs for infants and the role of a nurturing environment in an infant development. And so right now we're just gonna focus on the developmental milestones within that first year. And so understanding infant developmental milestones is essential for providing high quality care, support and early intervention when needed. It promotes the well-being and healthy development of infants and strengthens the partnership between caregivers, providers, and families in nurturing a child's growth. And so it's really important that you are aware of all of the milestones that children need to develop within these certain months of age, right? Just so you're able to provide the proper care and provide the proper needs for each of these children. And so this, you can easily look it up and get it online. You know, if you forget, oh, darn, I forgot what those milestones milestones are, you can just look it up on the CDC website and it's all there for you. It even goes all the way past one years. Um, so if you need it as a reference, you know it's there and it's there for anyone to use and print them out just to have as a reference, I think will be a great idea. And so knowing these developmental milestones is obviously very important for us as providers, right? For once, early detection of developmental delays, right? Recognizing when an infant is not meeting expected developmental milestones can be an early indicator of potential developmental delays or issues. This allows for early intervention, which can be highly effective in addressing and mitigating developmental challenges. So by you knowing what those milestones are, you're able to determine if there might be a, a delay in a couple of things, right? And so if we notice these delays, it's very important to have this communication with the families. You know, the earlier, the better. And so let's say you notice, you know, oh, this child isn't yet smiling, or, you know, smiling appropriately, or it's not, you know, saying a couple of words or things like that. If you're noticing these things, you definitely need to mention to the parents because there might be a delay. And I know that these conversations can be really hard um, to have with parents to talk about these delays or talk about these concerns, but it is our job to have these uh, conversations with the, with the families, right? And even let's say at a young age, you know, you notice some signs of possibly they're having some signs of autism, right? Again, it's important to have these conversations with parents and easy, it, and it's so much better to have them, um, to, to have these conversations early than later so they can get the help that they need. And however, when we do have these conversations with parents, you know, I remind my um, educators that we are not doctors, we're not diagnosing anything, we're just informing them of some of the things that we've noticed and for them to seek the appropriate help, right? And obviously, this conversation could be hard for you to um, having to tell them what you've observed and what you notice, but also for the families, you know, especially if this is their first child, they never want to hear these this type of news, right? So making sure that you're approaching it respectfully and um, carefully and delicately, just because it is a sensitive topic. Um, and so a lot of the time I have teachers say, well, the doctors will catch that. We don't need to say anything. Not necessarily, because a lot of the time when we go into the doctor for a doctor visit, you know, how 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 long do we really see the doctor? You know, we only see the doctor for maybe two minutes. You know, we see the nurse first and the doctor comes and then a nurse comes again. So we really only see him like maybe three minutes um, at the most. And the doctor can't diagnose anything within that three minutes. Right. So they're not really going to pick up on any of those cues or their or those signs. Um, and so it's really our job because we see them on a daily basis that we bring this up to the parents. And so knowing these milestones will help you determine if there are any concerns um, within their development. Knowing infant or sorry, tailored care. So understanding where an infant is in their development journey helps providers offer age appropriate care and activities. This ensures that the child's physical, cognitive and emotional needs are met at each stage of development. So knowing these milestones, you're able to tailor the care to fulfill those needs. For example, let's say, you know, <clears throat> a child is not yet reached the milestone of lifting himself up. Right. And so we need to tailor that care to kind of push him um, to get to that next milestone. And so providing that and tailoring that to kind of help them reach those milestones is important as well. And individualized support, recognizing that each child develops at their own pace. Providers can offer individualized support and adjustments to meet a child's specific needs. Some children may reach milestones earlier, while others may take a bit longer, and that's perfectly normal. So even though we have our, our checklist of all the milestones, you know, 
don't, don't get frazzled and don't think you need to tell the parent right away when a child right at two months is not doing X, Y, Z, right? It might take them a little bit longer to reach that milestone and that's okay. However, let's say come the fourth month or sixth month, they still hasn't reached that two month old milestone, then at that point, it's a little bit of a concern and let's, been, let's mention it to the families. Um, you know, and, but again, every child's different. Some children might reach milestones a lot earlier than others, and that's okay, you know, but it's just our job to keep those observations um, and to keep, you know, a writing journal or, you know, collect your data just so we have this as a reference when we do need to speak to the parents. And I think, and again, I think those checklists are really um, important and just checking it off every time we reach that new month and just keeping an eye on those one, on those milestones that have not yet been reached. Early stimulation. Providers can create an environment that encourages and supports developmental milestones. For example, they can introduce age appropriate toys and activities that stimulate an infant's sensory, motor, and cognitive skills. So this is really important. I actually have, I am actually gonna go deep deeper into this um, topic regarding age appropriate toys and activities that you can incorporate within the classroom later down this uh, webinar. But yes, providing that stimulation, you know, you want to make sure that your classroom is stimu stimulating enough for these infants. You know, you just don't want a stale classroom that just has the cribs and just has the high chair and that's it. You know, you want to make sure that there's activities. You want to make sure that you are following some type of curriculum. You know, I think a lot of the time uh, when people think about infant care, you know, they just think about babysitting my child. You're just going to feed them. You're going to nap them, maybe play with them a little bit, feed and feed again, nap again, maybe play for a little bit. But actually, you know, having a curriculum where it is age appropriate, so they are busy and they are stimulated, you know, and so we'll talk more about that later on. Building trust. When caregivers and providers understand infant development, they can respond appropriately to child's cues and needs. This fosters trust and secure attachment between the infant and their caregivers, which is crucial for emotional well-being. And so this even goes for just us, right? Just as, as we get older, that we need to build that trust with your significant other, with your friends. And so this goes hand in hand with infants. You know, they need to be able to trust you. Um, and so by you responding to their cues is a way to trust. By you showing love and affection is a way of building trust with these infants. And educational planning. This goes back to the curriculum I mentioned. For educators and childcare providers, knowledge of developmental milestones informs curriculum planning and educational goals. It ensures that the curriculum aligns with age appropriate learning objectives. So, again, having a curriculum age appropriate for the children that will help them reach these milestones, but also will help stimulate them, you know, adding sensory, adding, adding cognitive activities into their curriculum will help them reach their milestones. Um, emotional and physical needs of infants. Infants have a set of emotional and physical needs that are essential for their well-being and healthy development. And so we're going to talk about emotional needs first, right? Love and affection, like I mentioned a little bit ago. And so these needs are the foundation for building strong emotional bonds and ensuring infants thrive. So love and affection, again, we as adults need that, right? And so infants definitely need that. Infants need to feel loved and secure. Physical touch, cuddling, and gentle, affectionate interactions with caregivers are crucial for building attachment and trust. So, you know, hugging them, giving them a little cuddle. I'm not saying kiss them, don't kiss them, but just giving them that extra, you know, attention and affection and love. You know, infants need that. Um, and that, that goes hand in hand with building that trust, right, and building that attachment, Responsive caregiving. Infants require responsive caregivers who promptly attend to their cries and needs. This responsiveness builds a sense of trust and security in the infant, reinforcing their understanding that their needs will be met. So obviously we don't want a baby crying for like five, 10 minutes, you know, obviously you have a group of infants, so you might not be able to get to that infant right at that moment, but kind of looking their way, making eye connection and saying, hey, Charlie, I'm going to be with you one minute. I'm helping Johnny right now. Just give me one second, you know, and even though they're not going to respond to you, they, but they, they, they see you, they, they, they know that you're saying something to them, right. And you're, you're, um, you're letting them know that you hear them and you're going to come help them. 
Um, and then you go to them, right? And then also their needs, you know, making sure that obviously, as you know, your infants in the classroom, you're going to know some of their cues of when they're hungry and when they need their diaper change or when they're sleepy. And so responding to those cues is important. And that just goes back to building trust and security um, and building that relationship with the infants. Social interaction. Even from birth, infants are social beings who benefit from social interactions. This includes not, not necessarily talking, but it does, but also singing and making eye contact with infant to promote social and emotional development. And, um, you know, it's funny because when I think of social interaction, I also think about the way we talk to infants and the way we talk to babies. You know, a lot of the time we have this high squeaky voice that we say all the time in babies and it's just normal. It's like, oh my gosh, hi, how are you? Good morning. You know, our voice just like goes all the way up. Uh, and that's normal. You know, it's just part of what we do. And actually there was a study that was done that showed infants are highly responsive to that richly intoned sounds. And it's called infant directed speech. And they respond to that. You know, they like to hear that. And it's better than just being like, hi, Charlie, how are you? Good morning. How's your day going? Oh, I'm so excited that you're here today, right? It's so different. And so they don't want to hear that muted um, adult speech. No, they want to hear that high um, pitched sound and they really get, uh, it re they really respond well to that. And there's other studies that show that with these social interactions, you know, infants are developing language acquisition. Children acquire language through interactions, not only with their parents and other adults, but also with other children. And so, um, you know, children are surrounded by conversation, you know, and so as they're surrounded by these conversations, they, they will acquire the language that is being used around them. And so it is really important that we're constantly talking to them, constantly singing, reading stories so they can build that language acquisition and their language development. Um, and so stimulation, you know, infants need stimulation to explore and learn about their world. This includes providing age appropriate toys, tummy time and exposure to new sights, sounds and textures. And again, I'm really going to go deep into the stimulation because when we talk about age appropriate, <clears throat> excuse me, age appropriate toys, we're really focusing on sensory experiences and sensory exploration um, with all the five senses. And so again, we're gonna get, dive a little bit more <clears throat> into detail about that. And consistency, you know, establishing consistent routines and predictable caregiving practices helps infants feel secure, knowing what to expect in their daily routines provide comfort and stability. And so it's really important to have this communication with the parents because, you know, for us, we do ask for individualized schedules for each of our infants. And that just is for consistency and routine. And so we want to make sure that we're following the routines that are followed at home um, to help build that consistency. Obviously, as they get older, you know, their needs are going to change. And so that might change a little bit as well. But as long as we're making the same changes that are happening in the home, it should be really, it should be great for the infants when they're at your daycare or in your facility. And so, and making sure that we're staying on top of that schedule as well. I know sometimes, you know, we'll get the schedule and maybe you're just like, oh, you know, he did we're, we're not going to follow it for whatever reason. We're going to make, we're going to have the nap a little later. You know, now you're ruining his schedule. You're ruining, you're ruining his routine. And, you know, it could just be a domino effect from there. And so just really being on top of that schedule. And if you're not following the schedule or if something occurs, like let's say if mom said the child needs to, to nap at 12 o'clock. And so you go ahead and you try to nap them at 12 o'clock, but you know what? They're not napping. <laughs> You know, it's been like 30 minutes and they're not sleeping and that's okay, but you just need to communicate that to the parents so they're aware. Um, and we're going to talk about communication with families as well and partnership, but, you know, just making sure that we're following the schedule. And if for some reason we need to go off schedule or for some reason, um, again, the child didn't want to nap, we need to communicate to that to the families. And physical needs, nutrition. Proper nutrition is essential for an infant's growth and development. Infants typically receive their nutrition through breastfeeding or uh, formula feeding. Ensuring they receive adequate and appropriate feeding is critical. So a lot of the time in the infant classroom, you know, parents are probably providing all of their foods, right? 
However, sometimes as they get a little older, maybe like 18 months, um, maybe even 16 months, you know, if your school provides snacks or a lunch program, you know, we need to make sure that we're offering nutritional um, options, right? Making sure that it's always two food groups. If you are doing a lunch program, making sure there's healthy choices, right? We get our our meals through little spoons. And so it's a really great healthy choice for students. Now, let's say, you know, um, you notice that mom is, has starting to pack solid foods and it's, and he's eating a lot of the similar foods that we can provide at your, at the childcare. However, before you offer any of the snacks that, you know, you're serving that day, you need to check in with the parents to make sure that it's okay that you can offer them that snack, right? Don't just assume that, oh, well, mom packed strawberries. So it's okay if I give them some fruit or strawberries, you know, maybe that maybe mom packed organic strawberries and yours are not organic strawberries, you know? So always, always check in with the families. Again, it's very important to ask families about things or questions that you're unsure of before just doing it yourself and, and doing whatever it is that you want to do, right? We just want to make sure that um, parents agree to whatever it is that you're asking them and that we get their permission. And then breastfeeding and formula feeding, you know, just making sure that if we need to put these in the fridge, if we need to warm things up, you know, making sure that we're on top of that as well. For formula feeding, you know, there's licensing guidelines that fall into that. And so making sure that we're following those guidelines, for example, uh, for formula, if uh, once it's in the bottle and the baby starts drinking it, and let's say the baby didn't finish it, you know, we're not allowed to serve it to them later on, just because once the lips hit that nipple, there's bacteria that can grow into that. And so we're not able to give it back to them. So just making sure that we're following these guidelines as well. Sleep. Infants require plenty of sleep for growth and development. Creating a safe and comfortable sleep environment is important. Sleep patterns can vary, so caregivers should be prepared. And so, you know, obviously not the babies are not sleeping at the same time like they do in preschool setting. So they're all on different time frames, right? They're all having naps at different times. They're all the sleep length is different times as well. Sometimes they might have two naps. Sometimes they might have three naps within a day. You know, it's just all over the place, right? But just making sure that we have um, an area where they can nap quietly. If you have a nap room, that's even better because it's separate from every everything else and all the noise. If you don't, that's totally fine. Just make sure it's a nice, a, a nice cozy area that you can dim the lights a little bit, that you can have sound machines on. Um, making sure that if you provide the sheets for all of the, um, the crib mattresses, making sure that they're clean and you have enough for everyone making sure that they're nicely in their sleep sacks, if that's something that you do it within your facility, you know, just making sure that they're cozy and comfortable. Um, also, you know, going back to a communication with parents, you know, if you have a new baby and, you know, mom mentions, oh, you know, it, it could be a little bit hard to transfer to into the crib, you know, asking parents, well, what do you do at home that we can do here to help with that transition into the crib? you know, or let's say that wasn't even discussed. And so you're trying to help this baby go to sleep and it's just not working, you know, asking them, Hey, you know, we had a really hard time during nap time. Please give us some tips and tricks. So what you do at home, so we can do that here at um, the facility too. So again, just having that open communication is crucial. Diapering and hygiene, regular diaper changes, keeping the infant clean and dry and maintaining good hygiene are essential for preventing discomfort and skin issues. So I know some um, daycares, you know, they provide diapers and wipes, which is great. Um, we do too. However, you know, we do recommend a lot of the time for our younger babies that they provide their own diapers and wipes just because, you know, they, they might have really sensitive skin that some diaper just might not work for their skin, right? It just might irritate them a little, a little, um, a lot. And same with wipes too, you know, not some babies react differently to the certain wipes too. Um, and then when we are diapering and changing, making sure that we're changing it on a regular basis, you know, making sure that there is consistency with that. And when we change them, making sure that we're thoroughly cleaning them and cleaning them appropriately, making sure we're wearing gloves, making sure we're following all the licensing protocols when we change a diaper, um, you know, is important. Making sure that, you know, if we need to apply diaper cream, you know, making sure that we, I know a lot of the time in our infant care, you know, part of licensing is um, checking those expiration dates on the um, 
on the diaper creams, right? A lot of the time that gets overlooked because it's so, so tiny. It's on the very, very top where all the little barcodes are. And we don't, we, we don't even think about it, but I can't tell you how many times I, cause I'm so used to seeing that now, how many times I had to stop a teacher and say, oh, did you check that? It's expired. You need to throw it out. We cannot apply that on the child, you know? So just making sure that we're looking at those expiration dates on diaper cream before we apply it on. And even parents, they don't even notice, you know, I had, I had to tell a lot of parents, you know, unfortunately we were unable to apply this because it expired. Oh, I had no idea. Where is expiration date? I don't even know where it is. You know, and so educating parents on that, making sure that they're not applying ex expired creams on their child. Um, you know, so just making sure our eyes are always aware of little things like that. Safety. Infants are not mobile at birth, but as they grow, they become more mobile and curious. Child proofing the environment and keeping hazards out of reach is vital to their safety. Safety is obviously number one too, right? And so uh, making sure that your classroom and your classroom environment is safe for babies to be free and to kind of move around and explore. If you have um, low cabinets that are, you know, to the infant's level, making sure that those are locked, making sure you have extra proof on them. If you have, um, what is it, electrical sockets everywhere, making sure those are covered and making sure they're, um, the babies cannot take them off, right? Making sure they're secure. Uh, if your facility has an infant area where, you know, you your feeding section is kind of connected to like the floor section where they're playing, making sure that we sweep up the food when it's dropped on the floor from the high chair, because then another baby might crawl and grab that food and then they're allergic to that food and then boom, you have a whole issue, right? Or even choking hazard, you know, what if something, what if a child drops I don't know, edamame or, um, you know, a bite of cheese on the ground. And now this little infant's coming and puts it in his mouth and is choking. So just keeping our eyes aware of those things, you know, um, so just immediately sweeping up after we see something being dropped on the floor is important. Even if it's something spilled, let's say a child spilt milk on the floor and another child comes and like is crawling in it, but they're allergic to dairy. And so, you know, it's very important to make sure that our eyes are always, you know, looking around and wandering. And that's another reason why in licensing, they have those ratios to make sure that, you know, we have enough eyes on deck. Physical development. Supporting an infant's physical development includes offering tummy time to strengthen neck and upper body muscles, encouraging crawling and eventually walking and providing age appropriate toys and activities that stimulate motor skills. So, you know, providing an environment that has enough space for them to crawl, for them to start lifting themselves up, for them to have tummy time, for them to have these different opportunities to build these upper body muscles. And so the role of nurturing environment in infant development. And so a nurturing environment is a foundation upon which healthy infant development is built. It encompasses emotional support, physical care, and opportunities for learning and growth. When infants receive consistent and loving care within such an environment, they are more likely to develop into emotional secure, social adept, and intellectually curious individuals who are well prepared to navigate the challenges and opportunities of life. And so it's really important to have this nurturing environment because it helps in so many different, different areas, right? And it plays a pivotal role in infant development as it provides the emotional, physical, and social support necessary for infants to thrive and reach their full potential. So some key aspects is, you know, one is brain development, right? The first few years of life are critical for brain development. As we know, Babies' brains um, are like sponges, right? We, I, if you were with me before, we talked a little bit about this. Um, they're like sponges, so they're always absorbing information. And so a nurturing environment contributes significantly to this process. So responsive caregiving, such as promptly addressing an infant's cries and providing comfort, promote the developmental and neural pathways related to emotional regulation, communication, and social skills. Sharing positive emotion between a caregiver and an infant, such as just laughter and smiling, engage in great brain activity, 
And so, you know, making sure that we are smiling and that we are happy to be around them. You know, if we come into the classroom and you have this mean mugging face and you're just, your body language says it all, you know, the infants read off that. And it could, and if it's constant and consistent, you know, it could affect their brain development too, potentially. So just making sure that, you know, we're smiling at them, we're engaging with them, you know, you're showing this positive um positive behavior towards them you know they need that and so having this this nurturing environment also uh reduces the stress right we don't want infants to be stressed and infants can be stressed just like we can be stressed infants can be stressed too and so um in a nurturing environment you know it lowers the stress levels and reduced stress supports the development of healthy stress response system and helps prevent the negative effects of chronic stress and physical and mental health and so some examples of seeing that a child is stressed is like constant crying, you know, lots and lots of crying, um, you know, can be really, can, can be a sign of them being stressed. And so that's why it's important for us as caregivers to respond to that and not let it prolong. In addition to, if we notice some certain behaviors that have changed. So let's say all of a sudden, this child is no longer eating like they used to, that could be a sign of them being stressed. You know, they, they all of a sudden just don't want to eat. They don't want to eat anything, you know, um, and so that could be a sign too. So knowing those is important as well. And so chronic or severe stress can have negative effects on infant development. Prolonged stress can have impact the developing brain and may lead to long-term emotional and behavioral challenges. And um, exploration and learning, right? So infants in a nurturing environment are encouraged to explore their surroundings, fostering curiosity and a love of learning, providing age-appropriate toys, activities, and opportunities for exploration supports cognitive and motor skill development. So having, like I talked about before, not having a stale, you know, basic classroom just with a height chair and cribs, but having different variety of activities and items and toys for them to, to play with that will help stimulate and foster um, exploration, which will then go into cognitive development and everything else, right? And uh, making sure that these activities, again, we'll talk about that later, but making sure these activities and um, toys are age appropriate for them as well. Obviously, we're not going to give them, you know, a workbook for them to color. You know, that's just not appropriate at this age. Um, and so knowing what toys and what is appropriate and also what's safe too, you know, we, have to, we also have to keep that in mind. Physical health. Um, by the way, these are all my kids at Boomo work too. <laughs> Um, a nurturing environment ensures that infants receive proper nutrition, hygiene, and health care, contributing to their physical well-being and growth. A well-fed and healthy infant is better equipped to explore their environment, learn, and develop physically. So like we mentioned before, you know, making sure that they're eating um, nutritional food, making sure that we are following that schedule of when to feed them and how to feed them will all is all related with their, with their physical health. And so promoting cognitive and sensory development. So here we're going to dive into uh, the senses and I will provide you with some age appropriate activities and toys that you can implement within your classroom. And so uh, promoting cognitive and sensory development. Again, we're going to look into the importance of sensory experiences. And I will give you some examples of some activities you can incorporate. And so when we talk about sensory experiences, you know, we're talking about all the senses, right? We're talking about touch, hearing, sight, smell, and taste, you know, it's all of them. And sensory experiences are of paramount importance of infants as they are a key avenue through which babies explore and make sense of the world around them. These experiences are fundamental to infants' physical, cognitive, and emotional development. And so when we talk about um, these sensory experiences, I'm really talking about like sensory play, right? And sensory play is any activity that stimulates any of the five senses through play. These activities are designed to stimulate babies' touch, smell, taste, sight, or hearing, and can be introduced from birth. The idea of baby sensory play is that babies will begin to explore and discover through their five different senses, which has many benefits for their development. And so with these sensory play and these sensory experiences, infants develop cognitive skills. So it's all related, right? And cognitive skills are those skills we use when we solve problems and create novel ideas from current ideas. The process of solving problems begins with observation, that is taking note of attributes of objects. 
Young children use all their senses to explore objects and they file it away in their memories. Also, when children have sensory experiences, they store their whole body experiences in their sensory memory. We use our sensory memory to begin the process of understanding and gaining knowledge. So without these sensory experiences that babies need, they're not going to be able to develop these cognitive skills. So it's really important that we provide different activities and different toys to help stimulate a lot of these senses. And so I will show you a couple of age appropriate toys and activities that you can incorporate within your class. Now, these are just a little sample. <laughs> the list can go on and on and on and on, but I just have a couple of them that I really liked and that I wanted to share with you. And so we're gonna start with sight, right? And so I found these really fun sensory cards here um, from this website, what was it called? Praya, Praya and Peanut. And that website is based off, or that store is based off in the UK. And they really just focus on sensory materials, which is really cool. And they actually have some really fun Halloween sensory flashcards, but that's a whole nother thing. So anyways, <laughs> these sensory flashcards are super, are super cool and they can start at zero, at zero months. Right. And so when we think about sight, you know, uh, children can stare and focus at these constructing designs, right? And it can help them calm and stimulate um, certain babies. Actually, research and studies over the years have proven that babies' vision and eyes from birth are extremely immature and underdeveloped, which means they can't see color. Their vision is usually quite blurry, and they can only see a maximum of about 12 inches away. After much research, scientists begun to realize that high contrasting images, mainly black and white colors, registered with the baby's retina the best, meaning certain designs, if high contrasting enough, can trigger and aid the development of eyes of a baby. So, and I think I saw in the study that um, babies really only see black and white from zero months to about four months, I want to say. And so... Um, these would be really fun for them just to kind of stare and just kind of just, just to glance at it, right? But these cards can also improve their length of concentration, ability to track from left to right, up and down, side to side, to focus on one image, to calm their mind and not overstimulate like the busy world around them, right? So these cards can really just be something where they can just stare and explore with their eyes. And again, just kind of using their eyes up and down, side to side, looking at these different images. Obviously mirrors are fun, right? I love mirrors in an infant classroom. This one's a good one. I mean, it is kind of on the smaller side. So I would definitely recommend the long mirrors, obviously down to the baby's level so they can see themselves, especially if you have those mirrors that are super long, like rectangle size. And then a lot of them have like a, um, what is it? Like a bar that's attached to it. So babies can help pull themselves up and babies love to see themselves, right? They're always checking themselves out, <laughs> you know, pulling themselves up on that bar. And I think that's something really important to have in the classroom because they're exploring their cells, they're exploring their bodies, you know, they're looking at themselves. And so I think it's a really important to incorporate mirrors in an infant classroom. Touch, right? Touch is essential. And so when we think about touch, you know, a lot of the time we think about these materials, right? Materials that they can touch and feel. And so we are a lot of, I think a lot of the time that we go right into like sensory bins and sensory boxes full of just random stuff, which is totally fine. I'm all for that, especially like pasta noodles, you know, they love to touch that and feel that. Um, but also there's other things too, even like a, a white scarf, you know, the, the organza one that's really silky, you know, is a great that the babies can touch it. They can feel it. In addition to touching it, you know, I always like to play peekaboo with them. Either I'll put it on the infant and then I'll take it off and say peekaboo or I'll hide my face, and, you know, play peekaboo with them. So it's kind of like you're knocking out two senses in one, you know, same thing with like sensory things like the sensory crinkle square here. And so I'm assuming that like the outside of this square is probably like a soft velvety texture. And then the inside is like this crunchy paper. So when you touch it, it makes a sound, right? So again, you get two in one, you get the hearing and the crunch of the sound and you're touching the softness of the velvet. 
And they actually have a lot of, um, you know, touch and feel books out there with different textures. Uh, I think they have one with like farm animals where it's like you touch the bird's uh, feather, you touch the elephant's skin and it's like leathery. You touch like the sheep's fur and it's like, you know, like wool. Um, so having those different things is really essential. But not only are materials essential to be in the classroom, but just a human body touch is, in, is essential to have in the classroom. And so touch is like super important for human survival. Babies who are deprived of touch can fail to thrive. They can lose weight and they can even die. Babies and young children who do not get touched also have lower levels of growth hormone. So a lack of touch can actually stunt a child's growth. So even us as educators, touching infants, holding infants, cuddling them, touching, you know, they need that. They need that touch. So not only do they need materials to explore and touch, but they need human touch, you know? And again, I'm not saying um, kissing them and things like that, but just like holding their hand, caressing their head a little bit, you know, when we're holding them, patting them on the back and just giving them a nice little snuggle, right? is important for them and they need that. Hearing, you know, believe it or not, babies start hearing before they're even born, right? They start hearing in the womb. And so while they're in the womb, you know, they hear their mother's heartbeat, they hear their mother's digestive system, but they even hear sounds outside of the womb, right? And that's why a lot of moms, you know, they're encouraged to talk to their baby while they're in their tummy, you know, talk to them, sing to them, they can hear all of those things. And so, um, you know, hearing the voice of other family members too is part of the baby's world before birth. And so once the baby's born, the sounds of the outside world come out to be much louder and clearer. And so within the classroom, you know, having instruments you know, ha having a shaker, having bells, having drums, obviously making sure that they're safe and age appropriate, but having those materials so they can hear the different sounds is really great. Books and reading, you know, like this book here, well, generally all baby books, you know, they have a lot of pictures in them. And so that again, you're, you're, you're killing two senses in one, right? They're seeing and they're listening to your voice as you read to them. Also, you know, hearing singing, they love to be sung to. And so even during nap time, you know, nap time, you're rocking them, trying to get them to sleep. Instead of just not saying anything, you can sing them a song. I always sing when I end up in the baby's room, you know, if they're for short staff and I have to go in there, you know, I always, I always end up in the nap room and so I'm helping babies go to sleep. And so I'm always, you know, rocking them and I, I always sing a song. My go-to song is always, um, good night, Jacob. Good night, Jacob. Good night, Jacob. It's time to go to sleep. And, let, and sometimes, you know, they're not going to sleep until like it could take a, like 20 minutes for a couple of babies. And so I'm just singing everybody's name. You know, I'll say good night, Arden. Good night, Joey. Good night, Stephanie. It's time to go to sleep. And we're going to go to everybody's name <laughs> until the baby falls asleep. And so just making sure, and even during diaper changes, you know, during diaper changes, sing a song, especially if you have a baby who hates diaper changings or have a really hard time with it, you know, sing to them. It kind of calms them down and soothes them while you're changing them. Smell, right? Babies know when they, when they are born, you know, and they get close to their mom, they quickly develop their mom's scent, right? And so um, they know their mom's scent. They know what they smell like. They have a heightened sense of smell. And so incorporating different smells into the classroom is important. And so one really cute idea are smell bottles. These are actually not these particular ones, but there actually are real um, smell bottles within a Montessori classroom. But these you can make yourself, right? They're just spice, empty spice bottles that obviously you want to clean out thoroughly. And you add a little cotton ball into it and you... Uh, you can put a little bit of essential oil into it, right? You don't want to put a whole lot, just maybe a drop or two, put it in the bottles and making sure that they're, that babies can't open it and putting it close to their nose, right? We don't want to put it too close to their nose, just a little, give it a little distance so they can smell these different smells. You don't have, if you don't want to use cotton balls or if you don't have essential oils, that's not a problem. Maybe putting in like, um, like a, what is it called? a bay leaf in there, a cinnamon stick in there, or even a lemon peel or orange peel so they can smell it, right? Um, and flowers. Flowers is a great way for them to smell and incorporate in the classroom. However, you know, with both these smell bottles and flowers, you just have to make sure of allergies. 
you know, um, and just being aware of those things. And, but with flowers, you know, you want to make sure that there aren't little bugs left over on them, that they're safe, they're, that they're not poisonous flowers, that they don't have thorns on them. They don't have sharp, you know, edges, you know, all those things. You just have to be mindful about those things, but babies love to do that. They love to smell. They love to do all those things. Right. Um, and so it's important to incorporate these things into the classroom and taste, right? Um, our baby's sense of taste combined with their own natural curiosity helps them explore the big wide world. Even before they start solid, babies' taste buds can help them discover whether they like or dislike different textures and flavors. So, you know, babies are always putting things in their mouth, right? And so giving them time to explore different textures, different, um, different tastes, is really important. Even just ice, you know, having like a block of ice and just having them lick or just putting them in against their lips is um, a way to introduce to them to different textures and different feels and different temperatures. Um, obviously, we're not going to put the whole thing in their in their mouth. No, it's just like, it's just for them to touch and feel, maybe have a lick or two. Um, introducing foods. Again, if your school provides, you know, morning and afternoon snack and you notice that, oh, let's try cucumber. We haven't had cucumber or let's try pineapple or let's try pears, you know, different foods, um, you know, introducing those to the children. But again, just getting the okay from the parents before you do that, because maybe a parent's not ready for them to have pineapple yet, because, you know, sometimes pineapple can leave like a little sting in the mouth. Um, so maybe parents are kind of like, no, I don't want, I don't want you to introduce that. And you also have to think about culture too, um, and what babies can and cannot have within their culture. Um, so just some things to be mindful about, but I always say, you know, if you're going to introduce, if you have new foods for snack time, um, always ask parents before you offer, or even ask parents before you go out and order it or buy it too. You don't want to waste money because if, if all the parents say, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Now you have all these pineapples, right? So just making sure that we have that communication with families. And so creating partnership with families is super important. So effective communication with families and involving families in the caregiving process, right? Um, creating these partnerships between infants and um, teachers is essential for providing the best possible care and support for infants. It promotes a nurturing, consistent, and indiv individualized environment that contributes to the healthy development and well-being of the child. It also strengthens the trust and collaboration between caregivers and families, benefiting everyone involved in the infant care. So it really takes um, this partnership to really provide the best needs for infants. Right. Because, again, we want to follow the routines that are happening at home. So we need to have that communication with, with the parents to let us know what that looks like so we can incorporate it within our classroom. And just having parents involved within the caregiving process, too. I know a lot of parents are that's automatic. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of parents who aren't really involved, I would say, in infant care, but there might be some. And so it's really important to have them um, be a part of that process. And so one way we can have, we can do this is by, you know, effective communication with families. And so effective communication uh, builds positive relationships between the two, right? Ensuring the well-being and development of children and promoting a collaborative partnership between parents, educators, and caregivers. And so one way we can do that is being approachable and welcoming, right? Create an inviting and friendly atmosphere where parents feel comfortable approaching you. Greet parents warmly and show genuine interest in their concerns and input. And so, you know, parents are coming, they're dropping off, you're saying, hi, good morning, how are you? How is your morning so far? How did we sleep last night? What's the schedule looking like? Perfect, awesome, have a great day, and you go on, right? Instead of just being like, hi, good morning, see you later. You know, it's like totally different. And so, and also just being approachable, you know, you never want a parent to feel scared to come to you to talk about something, right? You always want to feel, you always want to be approachable. You always want to be, um, be welcome. You always want to invite parents to talk to you too. Um, and just, you know, having that warm and genuine uh, behavior and body language too, right? And then going back to smiling, smiling and just, you know, feeling warm and welcoming is important. Active listening, you know, give parents your full attention when they speak. Use verbal and nonverbal cues such as nodding and maintaining eye contact to show that you're actively listening. Avoid interrupting and allow parents to express themselves fully. So, for example, I had a parent actually the other day explain to me that their child had a really bad diaper rash. 
And he was going on explaining to me, you know, the child was sick. Um, she was a little constipated. So they gave her prune juice. Like he went on and on and on. And so I was listening, you know, I was nodding. I, I had like facial expressions. I'm good with making eye contact. And so I was just looking at him like right in the eyes. And this shows that I'm listening and that I understand and that I hear you and that we are going to do whatever you tell us to do to help that child with this diaper rash, you know? And so he's telling me everything that they are doing at home. He even asked for my input. What do you think we should do? You know, and I told him what I felt and he agreed. And so we made a plan that we are going to do X, Y, Z until this diaper rash is gone. Uh, but it's just listening, right? Just listening and nodding and taking all this information in and remembering this information and then implementing this information that day. You don't want to just, the parents talking to you, and you're just like distracted. And now you totally forgot what that conversation was about. And then you totally forgot about that she had the diaper rash, right? Um, and so making sure that we're actively listening, parents will feel that, oh, you, you care. You care about my child. I trust you that you're going to take good care of them because you're listening to what I'm telling you. Empathy and understanding. Show empathy and understanding by acknowledging parents' feelings and concerns. Validate their experiences and emotions, even if you don't necessarily agree with them. And so, um, again, you know, going back to the diaper rash, right? Just understanding, showing empathy, validating what, you know, how she's feeling and how she's feeling when we, we do diaper changes, you know, because dad mentioned that it's really painful for her because it's really, it's a really bad diaper rash and it was poor thing. Um, so, you know, just validating that. Right. I also have another family who was telling us that please, please, please make sure for my son that you encourage him to use his right hand and not his left hand. And, um, we're like, okay, not a problem. You know, we might not agree with it. We might say, oh, well, let him use whatever hand he wants to use. Right. But we're going to listen to what the parents are telling us because then maybe it's a cultural thing. Right. And so we need to make sure that we're aware of those things and that we agree with them and that we're going to do what they tell us to do. Cause at the end of the day, this is their child. And so we need to, we need to do what parents tell us to do. And again, even if we don't agree with it. Clear and open communication. Use clear and straightforward language, avoiding jargon or technical terms when possible. Encourage open and honest communication by assuring parents that their opinions and questions are valid. And so, um, you know, just having that clear communication, telling them like it is, you know, um, and also just being honest too. You know, I think sometimes we might be afraid of parents and let's say, a child fell down and um, got a, a scratch on their arm, right? You need to tell the parents that, you know, you need to be honest of what happened. And you also need to write an incident report, obviously, but you need to be honest about it, right? Even if um, like, for example, today I had a parent message in and say, oh, the kids didn't go outside today or did the kids go outside today? And, you know, the teacher could have said, oh, yeah, they went outside, they went outside, they had fun. But instead, she said, no, you know, actually, they didn't go outside, because it was a really hot day. And we decided to keep them in, we're going to try to go outside later on. Right. And so just being honest about it, we don't need to lie to parents, you know, we just need to be straightforward with them. Regular updates and progress report. So provide regular updates on child's progress development and any important changes or milestones. Share both positive achievements and areas for improvement. And so some ways that you can do this is through a parent-teacher conference. You know, we do parent-teacher conference even for our infants. It's a time where we can sit one-on-one -on -one with the child's parents and go over their development, go over concerns or things like that. However, if it's something that needs to be addressed earlier before the scheduled parent-teacher conference, then you make that conference with the parent, you know? Um, and a lot of the time when I say that we do parent-teacher conferences during tours, I get some looks on like for infants, really? And then I try to explain to them, you know, this is why we do it because during drop-off and pickup, you know, it's literally... Hi, bye, hi, bye. It's we don't really have time to sit down or to stand and talk to the parents about you know development and things like that. And so having this 20 minute, 30 minute time to sit down with them really gives us an opportunity to go over everything that we observed, go over some things that parents have concerns over, and to go over their achievements and their progress, right? Um, additionally, having apps like ProCare or Brightwill is a great way to send updates to parents daily on a daily basis. 
And so at our school, we do use ProCare. It is an app that we use on tablets. And so parents check in, they check out using the app, and we send parents updates about their child's about their child's day. It's very detailed. Um, we input and we send them and we let them know uh, what time we fed them, how much they ate, if they didn't eat, if we gave them a bottle, how many ounces they drank, when we change them, if we change them, if it was urine or if it was a BM, if we applied diaper cream, we let them know um, what time they went down for nap, if they had a hard time napping, if they were coughing during nap time, we put that in there as well. It's very detailed, right? in addition to pictures and videos. So we are always sending updates of pictures and videos of their, of their child as well. And so this is really helpful when you have those parents who are always worried and concerned. It's really beneficial for those first time parents in, into a daycare setting with their, you know, with their only child. And it makes them feel, it makes them feel good to see these updates. They get to see a little glimpse of their child throughout the day. Even if they're at work, they can just pop up the app and say, oh, there's my babe, you know, and take a look. And we're always getting positive, positive feedback from parents appreciating the app. You know, I had a dad um, tell me that he was in a meeting and the meeting was just going on and on and on. And he got, you know, a notification on the app and he clicked it and it's his daughter just smiling away. And he said that literally made my day just seeing her happy, you know, seeing her in her element and it just made him feel good and it just made his day. And so, and then that's another way of, of having them trust in us, right? Showing them like, look, this is what your child's doing. You know, it's all out there and we're, we're, we have nothing to hide. You know, this is what we're doing. This is what's happening. And just keeping them in the loop of things um, is really important. So if you have, if your center has Procure Brightwell, that's amazing. If it doesn't, you know, maybe ask um, your director to look into it because it is a really great addition to have into in any, any program even preschool program. Additionally, with the ProCare app, if a child, let's say, um, gets an injury, you know, on the app, there are um, incident reports that you can fill out and send to parents right away. In addition to, let's say, you know, you have a question right on the spot about something, you know, you can direct message on the app to the parent and the parent can message you directly through the app. So it's really, really convenient. Yes, ProCare is great. I agree, Judy. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's amazing. It's great to have. And it, it might take a little while to get used to at first, but once you have it on deck, it's a, a great feature in addition to have. Um, so remember that effective communication with parents is an ongoing process that builds trust and strengthens the partnership between parents and caregivers, educators, and even healthcare providers. It ultimately contributes to the positive growth and well-being of children. So it's imperative to have the, this open communication with families um, because that's how you're going to be able to provide the necessary care for infants. And so involving families in the caregiving process. Involving families in the caregiving process is a collaborative and person-centered approach that recognizes the expertise and importance of families in the well-being and development of their loved ones. It promotes better communication, individualized care, emotional support, and overall improved outcomes for the individual receiving care. Whether in healthcare, education, or any other caregiving settings, this approach fosters a sense of belonging and trust. Right. And so, again, going back, it's just going, it's kind of just all correlates together, you know, and it's just showing the importance of having that relationship, having this open communication with families, having them involved within their process is very, very crucial for infants development. And you have to work as a team, right? You have to work as a team. And so in conclusion, you know, infant care is not just about meeting physical needs. It's about creating a nurturing environment that supports their holistic development. But understanding infant development, building strong relationships, and implementing nurturing practices, we can provide the foundation for these tiny humans to thrive. And so, you know, really, I think it just goes back to make building these strong relationships with infants, you know, making them be able to trust you, making them feel safe and secure in addition to providing a, a nurturing environment for them, you know, providing age appropriate materials, uh, providing age appropriate toys, always singing to them, always having that connection with them, touching them, um, making them know that you care, right? And that you're there for them and you're going to fulfill their needs and you're going to respond to them when they need you. You know, they don't have the words right now, you know? And so it's our job to, 
to get to know our infants and to observe them and understand when they need something and understand that we need to to help them when they when they do show those cues and they do show that distress um, is really important. And so that concludes the workshop. Um, and so it looks like we have a couple minutes for a question or two. And so if you have any questions, um, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, and as those are coming in, you know, I just want to let you know about our next webinar um, next Friday. So again, if, if you're new to here, welcome. And we do webinars every Friday. I always have a new topic. I also want to know if you have a topic that you're interested in, you know, go ahead and send me an email. Justin, can you put my email in the chat for them? Just make it easier for them. Uh, I do have it at the end of the slide, but sometimes it just goes by too fast. But if you want to email me your topic that you, you know, you might have an idea what you wanted to hear, you know, let me know, send me an email um, and I will try my best. I don't know everything, but I, I am very, I, I do know a lot. Um, I can try to create a webinar for you. Yes, I'm the one always doing the classes. <laughs> And so uh, I will be here, I'm here every Friday. And so our next webinar is Effective Strategies for Conducting Staff Meetings. Um, so, you know, a lot of these, uh, I try to switch up the topic so that it is um, helpful for staff and teachers, but also for admin, you know, so I try to switch it up a little bit. But yes, if you, all the videos and all of our past webinars are on YouTube. And so if you missed a couple of our other ones, last week we did Circle Time, which was really fun. Um, that's on uh, on on YouTube if you missed that. But I will also be, uh, I also submit blogs. And so I will have a blog following up from this webinar and the slides will be available for you as well. And so if you look into our website, there's blogs from the past that also have slides on there too. If you want to check those out, if you, if this is your first time and you kind of want to take a peek at some of the other, other uh, webinars. But yeah, thank you so much. And I guess there were no questions. But again, if you if a question pops up later on, just go ahead and send me an email. And if you have any topics, you know, go ahead and send me that. But I hopefully this wasn't too much information and it was helpful for you, I hope. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. It's so nice to meet all of you. Thank you, Judy.